<laughs> really bit over that one point. <laughs> So, since the beginning of time, humans have looked at the plants, animals, things around them, and given them names, right? Started naming things and noticing that they're different. Um, but as, as, you do, as you look around and see that there are different animals, and different things, um, you start to create a definition of a species. What makes this different from that? Yeah, I'm recording that. Thanks. Um, so the things that your definition of species has to count for, has to count for two things. One, the distinct things, so things that are separate, even though they occur in the same area. And then the connection between them that helps them exist um, among different populations, but they belong to the same species. Okay? So you have one thing where you have different species occurring in the same area, and then you have another part of it is that you have a population that belongs to a species in that area. Okay, so for example, um, those three birds up there are all sparrows. But they all look the same to me. So I, by using my naked eye, would probably classify them as the same species. But they're actually different species. And if you look hard enough, you can see some slight differences among them. So those are different species, even though they look very similar. Um, these are all, you know what those are? They are dead. <laughs> they're fox squirrels. They're squirrels. And they, these occur around here, not as common as the gray squirrels. Um, but they're all the same species, but they all look different. Okay? So you can have black fox squirrels or kind of reddish ones or gray ones. Okay? But they are the same species. So what makes them the same species and how come these look like, but they're not the same species? Okay, so we'll get into that. So a sympatric species... Um, the word or prefix sem means the same or united. So these are species that occur in the same area. But they are distinct, meaning they're separate species. Okay, and they are phenotypically different. What's a phenotype? Right, so it's a physical expression. So even though you and, you and I may not be able to tell the difference between those sparrows, if you look hard enough, you can see some slight differences. And they also utilize different parts of the habitat. So that's where uh, you know, Craig added, they behave separately. They use different parts of the habitat. They either do different things or live in different things or are awake in different times. Um, their behavior is separate, so they may mate at different times of the year. Um, they may live in different parts of a tree, even. And so again, even if they look alike to us, they, as a species, or a sympathetic species, are separate. So, all of these are species of squirrel. Okay, these belong, these live, will live in the same area. Um, you guys have seen this guy, right? Gray squirrel, those are everywhere. Um, what is this? Fly squirrel. Anyone seen these? No. Yeah, so these are around here too. Yeah? Oh, so what, why don't you see these guys as much as these guys? They they can't actually live in the same area, but they do live in the same They fly. They don't actually fly, they glide. What what else? Do anyone know anything else about flying squirrels? No, they are a little more shy. They also are nocturnal. 
So you guys only go out at night because these guys are out in the daytime. This is a fox squirrel again. You can't tell them, but they're bigger than the uh, gray squirrels, and they're colored a little bit differently. Sometimes they can look similar to those. They're like, this one's gray, but it has some red in them. Gray, no red. Anyone know what this is? It's not a beaver. It is a groundhog. Or a woodchuck. Or what else? A marmot. Uh, I saw one of these the other day, actually, driving down 280. It's one just sitting in the in a field. But what, how is he separate from, let's say, the gray squirrel again? Well, yeah. he has a shorter tail. What's that? What he eats, yeah. And he goes under the ground. Yeah, so these big holes go under the ground. These are all species of squirrel, but they, they live in the same area. They're sympatric. But they behave differently, they look differently, and they're distinct. So they're different species. A groundhog is a woodchuck, is a yeah. is a marmot. Well, I that. Okay, yeah, question. Are breeds of dogs like an example of different species, or are they all the same? They're actually all the same species. But they're messed up because they're artificially selected. So we, we have separated and splintered their gene pool into different, different types. But naturally, you know, you don't find wolves that look like chihuahuas and then a pack of chihuahuas. <laughs> <laughs> breed is uh, it's not usually used when we're talking about species because a breed is an artificial selected uh, man-made thing. So species, we're talking more about natural, yeah, natural selection. But yeah, you can basically create species through artificial selection. But uh, that's not what we're talking about here. Yeah? Like, does one squirrel do not, like, does it just, like, made by God? Yes. <laughs> they're, just, they're, they're not artificially selected. They are natural. <laughs> made by God, if you want to say that way. Or by evolution. Or both. Okay, so, sympatric species, then. Um, they can, they... They have to have some way to avoid mating with each other because they're separate. Um, they may uh, may not do it just by um, size differences. Sometimes things can look exactly the same, but may be separated in some other way. So they could have visual signals. So this is um, a lace wing up here. There are different species of lace wings that look almost exactly the same. But they have different calls. So these are different calls of three different species. And you can see, um, you can see that they look differently. That just means that the sounds are a little bit different. Um, so their sound production may separate them. So the females are all of a certain species are only attracted to the specific species call. Okay? And if you have a call that sounds like a different species, then you're not, the females won't make it back. Or you may have chemical signals. Electrical signals. Um, another example of, of insects that do this, um, it should be coming out pretty soon, are lightning bugs. Give off, that's a mating signal that the, the males give off to attract females. So there's other ways other than just uh, physical appearance um, that species can separate themselves. So that's one. One way of looking at species. Another thing is subspecies. So, um, Michael, you said uh, species is the most specific. You can actually split species up into even subspecies. And you can do, you go even crazier than that. A subspecies is within a single species, you, have, you can have varying populations. So these are gray, gray rat snakes, or rat snakes, sorry. And this is the south to the east. This is where they occur and then you have five different subspecies where they look different. 
this is the one that occurs here. It's called the gray rat snake. You see these in your yard. They start coming out right about now out of hibernation and start mating. I've had a couple in my yard. One was like this big, and then one was like six feet long. <laughs> yeah, we probably would. No, we played with them, and then we let them go. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. I have a picture. <laughs> They're harmless. Well, they may bite you, but they aren't poisonous. Yeah. No, I took up pictures, though. Um, but rat snakes, if you found a rat snake from up here and I found a rat snake from there, you'd swear they were different species, but because they look very different, but. They're actually the same species. And what keeps them the same is along the borders, you know, the rat snakes that look like this and the rat snakes that look like that, around here they will continue to mate with each other, create hybrids, okay, with intermediate characteristics. So I like snakes. I know lots of people are scared of them. So Ernst Mayer, he's this old guy in the corner. He came up with, with what was called the biological species concept, and this is how he defined species, which is groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from other such groups. So in English, it would just be uh, groups that don't mate with each other. Okay? They may be physically separated or behaviorally separated, but for whatever reason, they don't naturally mate with each other. Okay, so a species is a group of organisms that will meet together under natural conditions and they will create viable fer fertile offspring. So sometimes there are birds um, that will hybridize with each other of different species but their offspring won't be able to, aren't fertile. So like, um, this isn't an example, but like horses and mules, horses and donkeys make a mule, but a mule is sterile. You can't take two mules and mate them. Um, similar to that, if, if a two species will hybridize and they'll create offspring, but those offspring can't mate, then, it's not, then they're still considered separate. Okay, so uh, reproductive isolation then is what creates a species. Okay, this is a, a little comic uh, biology, biological humor here. So you have a mermaid and what do you call these guys? Half horse centaur or something? And they fell in love and so they are anti-biological species concept because even they would be naturally separated. They're both mythical creatures. You're all laughing really hard inside, I know. <laughs> okay, so biological species concept focus on the ability to exchange genes. So you guys have that uh, genetically similar. Uh, if you're too genetically distinct, then you cannot exchange genes. And there are two ways... Um, two modes of isolating mechanisms. You can have pre-zygotic isolating mechanisms. So before the zygote, what does zygote, what's a zygote? What's that? The egg and the sperm uniting. So you can have mechanisms that prevent union of sperm and egg or formation of a zygote. Or you can have post-zygotic isolating mechanisms, meaning they mate, but uh, something happens genetically that keeps them from having fertile offspring. <clears throat> and we'll go through these in a little more detail. So pre, here are some pre-zygotic isolating mechanisms. One, ecological isolation. So lions and tigers can mate and can make fertile offspring. If, it's, if it, the male is the father, it's a liger, and if the female, wait, if, I can't remember how it is. I think it's, if the male is a lion, it's a liger. If the male is a tiger, it's a tie-in, or something like that. And they actually look a little bit different. Depending on you said bear. Lion and tigers, sorry. 
Bears. No bears. Lions attacking the bears. Okay, so this is one of those hybrids. This is the, the tiger would be the male, I think, there. Um, so why don't lions and tigers mate in nature? What's that? They're enemies? <laughs> exactly. All right, so lions are in the savanna. Tigers are in the jungle. Okay? Are species? No, they're different species. So but, okay, I'm just, that's like the, when you're talking about mating protection earlier, like how different species, like they hybridize. <laughs> like, uh, the way I took it was that certain species are normally only attracted to their species type. Yes. So, what happens whenever a species makes something wild? Uh, I don't know. They may be, it usually happens when they're very similar, okay? So it's not going to be like, you know, a bear and a lion, okay? But lions and tigers are very similar. They're both cats. Um, they even look kind of similar, have similar body shape. Uh, it's not, yeah, it's not going to happen with things that are very similar. Um, but yet, these are the things that keep them from mating. One is they live in different places. Uh, behavioral isolation. So these are blue-footed boobies, which is a type of bird. And they do a little funky dance before they mate. <laughs> different species will do different dances. Okay? So they're behaviorally isolated. You have to do the right dance. <laughs> it's true. Temporal isolation. So, they may mate at different times of the year. Uh, so, some wild lettuce, there's lots of different types. But, um, and they will, if you can get them to artificially um, fertilize these, the, the seeds with pollen. But, they, they, uh, they flower at different times of the year. So, they don't ever, the pollen and the eggs don't ever come in contact. You have mechanical isolation. So um, bees and pollen, bees carry pollen and um, on different parts of their body, depending on which flower they go to and the length of the stamen that holds, holds the pollen. And where it's placed on the body, it will only fertilize the same flower it's supposed to. So That's you can. Okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and another one is something happens where Maybe all these other things line up, um, but just genetically the sperm and the, and the egg just won't fuse. Some sort of chemical reaction that doesn't happen, so you don't get a viable zygote. Those are all pre-zygotic isolating mechanisms. We only have one post-zygotic post isolating mechanism, uh, and that's hybrid inviability. So, again, mules are crosses between horses and donkeys, which are both artificially selected. But, um, you can't take two mules and make them because they won't, uh, won't create a viable zygote. Okay, so this is a good concept. It works in a lot of uh, different ways and helps us to identify a species, but there are some things that are wrong with it. Um, so reproductive isolation, so just being isolated reproductively is may not be the only thing maintaining the species. Um, and there may be hybridization, so um, there are lots of plant species in California that are not genetically isolated. So there is a lot of hybridization going on. And 10% of bird species will hybridize as well. So there's something else going on, just not just reproduction isolation, that is also keeping them from becoming one big species. Um, so in the ecological species concept, though, the distinctions are maintained by natural selection. So there are you know, different 
forces at play at different areas, competition, uh, the climate, whatever, which creates these separating uh, separate species. Um, but stabilizing selection will maintain those species adaptations, and then those hybrids, which are along the middle, are quickly eliminated from the gene pool. Pool. So here, this. Um, Notice anything weird about this polar bear? Well, it is dead. It has black eyes. You know why it has black eyes? It's actually part, it's a half grizzly, half polar bear. So it's a hybrid. So polar bears and grizzly bears will hybridize. What? Polar bears, well, polar bears just live along the edges. And then grizzly bears live in the middle, but where they come together, they will hybridize sometimes. So that's what, hap that's what happened with that guy. <laughs> but um, grizzly bears are more adapted for an interior lifestyle. They eat berries and, and, and salmon and things like that. Whereas polar bears are more adapted to eat seals and live on the ice. Um, so when you create a hybrid like that, it's going to have intermediate characteristics that aren't good for either spot. So usually they will not do very well and be eliminated from the gene pool. This one got eliminated by the gene pool by getting shot by Eskimos, but um, usually it's more natural than that. Okay, so it's also difficult to apply this concept to populations that are ge geographically separated in nature. So again, lions and tigers, and species that don't hybridize in nature will sometimes hybridize in captivity. And another thing is a lot of organisms don't even mate. They aren't sexual. They're just asexual. So a lot of plants are asexual. So how do you define a species if it doesn't even mate? Okay. So there's a weakness of the biological species concept. Okay. So, uh, we are going to talk about, in more detail, um, how to classify some of these organisms and how to discuss their evolutionary relationships and their characteristics. Um, uh, but one thing we're going to talk about is how species occurs. So how does one species go into multiple species, or how do become other species combine into a new species? Uh, cladogenesis is the process of one ancestral species giving rise to multiple individual species. Um, and if the species are defined by reproductive isolation, then the process of speciation is identical to the evolution of whatever that mechanism is that reproduc uh, reproductively isolates them. So uh, an example we'll give up uh, multiple times is chiclid or yeah chiclid fish in Lake Victoria. So all of them derived from one species of fish. Lake Victoria is this large lake in Africa, and it has a very diverse number of these uh, chiclids um, or cichlid. I can't remember how to say that. Cichlid. cichlid. It's not. You don't say cichlid. Cichlid. Let's say cichlid. Okay. All of these are cichlid fishes. They are derived from the same organism. Okay. Selection is another. So I mentioned before with the um, polar bear, grizzly bear hybrid. Um, it can reinforce the species um, and isolating mechanisms. Okay, so two populations may be only partially reproductively isolated. So, for example, you have some flycatchers, which is a species of bird in Europe, that will hybridize. Um, but natural re selection, again, like I was talking about with the grizzlies and the polar bears, one's adapted for ice, one's adapted for interior living. And natural selection will keep those hybrids from overtaking the whole population.
Okay, another process where, where new species or where um, populations can be genetically isolated is called genetic drift. This happens through random changes that causes reproductive isolation. Okay, and there are a couple different kinds. You can have a bottleneck or you can have the founder effect. And basically what happens is you have um, some event that creates, that selects for a small subset of the normal population. So here we have red and green ladybugs, and let's say a giant tornado comes by and wipes out most of the ladybugs, and now there are only four survivors, and now there's only red, and they're all red. So just by chance, um, if you're going to reduce the population and stuff by some way, you may change the genetic structure. So where we once had red, green, now all, all we have is red. A bottleneck is a similar thing where you may have a small corridor where only a few species can get through. Again, it's red and yellow here. Only a few get through, and let's say the ones that get through are, are red. So now we no, no longer have the yellow ones. Um, in the Hawaiian Islands, it's thought to that a uh, bottleneck occurred. So you had, you had this population of fruit flies, which was very diverse, but then a couple of them colonized the Hawaiian Islands, and their genes were much, you know, uh, a lot different than the originals, and so the population of fruit flies in Hawaii is a lot different than on the mainland. Okay, species can also adapt, which will lead to um, speciation. Um, and so this occurs, uh, these are all anoles, which are species of lizard. The green anole, you'll see that in your yard, you know what's in those. Around this time, springtime, they will start uh, mating, and the males will extend their dewlap, that little thing on their neck. Um, and they're basically, again, trying to attract females, showing off how big and muscular they are. <laughs> so they'll extend their dewlap as a bright red color, and like the brighter the color, the more handsome they are or whatever. <laughs> and they also do like push-ups. <laughs> and you can, seriously they do, if you, you can get an adult to do this. If you see a big one, the big ones are usually the males, you can get um, anything that's red and just kind of wave it up and down beside them and they'll start to do that and do some push-ups. <laughs> And because uh, they'll 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 think that you are another male threatening their territory. But if you look at the anoles across the islands in the Pacific, so these are all, are not the Pacific, the Caribbean. Uh, they have a bunch of different species, and they have different colored dewlaps based on their environment. So they adapted to the environment, even though um, even though they're all um, you know potentially doing the same thing, trying to attract mates. Um, so, and the reason why they aren't the same color is because, well, maybe uh, there's a lot of red on this island. There's a lot of red plants. So red wouldn't work very well, so it has to adapt and maybe change to a little yellowish orange. But this one over here has a lot more gray in it. Okay, so they may adapt to the specific uh, conditions of their environment, and that may create speciation as well. Um, speciation usually occurs because of a geographic event that will isolate populations. Um, it's a two-stage process, so first populations have to diverge in some way. And then they have to evolve some sort of reproductive isolation mechanism to maintain that divergence. But if, um, if they get back together before they've fully become different species, become fully reproductive isolated, then that, might, that may erase those differences. 
So it's more likely to occur in geographical isolated populations. So, for example, to illustrate this, let's say you have these beautiful butterflies. That's a butterfly. Okay, and they're floating along. Um, and all of a sudden, this giant mountain range separates the green ones and the black ones. Over time, they're going to evolve different things, and they're going to be reproductively isolated. But let's say uh, someone builds a giant road between these two mountains before they are reproductively isolated. And now they can mate with each other, and now any differences that they may have evolved over that short time can be eliminated because they can still mate and just create a more diverse gene pool. So it's more likely that they will become different species if they remain geographically isolated. Um, and that's called uh, allopatric speciation. Okay, where a geographic separation creates the different species. Okay, so an example of this is in New Guinea. Uh, you have a mountain range that runs through the middle of the island. And uh, kingfishers, which are a type of bird that get hunt fish, um, that are separated by these different geographical features have evolved different mechanisms and become reproductively isolated. Sympatric speciation is um, where a species becomes another species, becomes two species, um, even though they occur in the same area. So whereas allopatric speciation would be where they're separated, sympatrics, where it occurs without separation. Um, this happens in plants by what's called polyploidy, where their chromosomes just double by some mistake. Um, and this is what has happened artificially with our wheat. Um, wild wheat didn't have as much wheat as we have today, and it actually happened through polyploidy and hybridization of multiple different strains. Okay, there's two types of polyploidy. You can have autoploidy, where all the chromosomes come from a single species, and an error in cell division Okay, an error in mitosis um, causes all the chromosomes to be on the same side. So you have a tetraploid instead of a diploid. And because it's tetraploid and the rest of them are diploid, diploid then they can't hybridize or they can't um, mate with the other species. Allopolyploidy is where two species hybridize and then they double their chromosomes. And because they both doubled, now they can uh, pair with each other and sexually reproduce. Okay, this happens a lot in plants because plants can often um, reproduce asexually and sexually. So it may be asexual for a time and then through some polyploid event, uh, be able to reproduce sexually. Um, sympatric species may also occur through what's called disruptive selection, where you have individuals exhibiting different phenotypes, and then those phenotypes evolve isolating mechanisms, and then those phenotypes are retained as a polymorphism within a single population. So a polymorphism is, poly means what? What does morph mean? 
right? So many varieties or many changes. So you may have um, some sort of genetic variability in a population which creates different morphs or polymorphs, okay? And eventually maybe those polymorphs may become different species, okay? So the example here is you have a gray bird, it comes to these different islands. Now you have, um, and then it has this polymorph, so it has a red bird and a yellow bird, they live on different islands, and then that's, that creates a different species. Okay, adaptive radiations is where closely related species evolve from a common ancestor by adapting to different parts of the environment. So this is what Darwin found when he came to um, the islands off of South America. Do you remember what those islands were called? Okay. Yeah, the Galapagos Islands. And what did he find there? Finches. Finches. And do you know what? Uh, why did he find all these different types of finches? Yeah, their beak sizes were different. So there were a bunch of different types of seeds on the island. And so this one finch species that came from the mainland then diverged into a bunch of different species because of all the different um, seed sizes it can specialize on. Oh, I, it's right there. That's why you guys said Galapagos. Uh, they think the same thing said happened in the Hawaiian Islands with birds that colonized the Hawaiian Islands as well. Um, islands, this will often happen in islands because they're in such a small area that a catastrophic event can very easily just wipe everything out and now there is open resources for anything to come and colonize. So what would be a catastrophic event that might happen in Hawaii? A tsunami. A tsunami, yeah? A volcano, a volcano right? Even just a big storm that comes through and kills everything. I don't think they get hurricanes much over there, but the big storms. Okay. Character displacement is... Uh, where you have natural selection in each species that favors individuals that use resources not used by the other species. So again, this is kind of going along with the finches. Um, you may have two species that overlap in some resource they use. Um, and so they overlap in body size, but because of competition over time, um, the the phenotypes on the edges are favored. Okay. So basically by specializing in, um, rather than being a generalist and just eating all different types of seeds and having different types of phenotypes, by specializing into small and big, they can, they can have greater fitness. Okay, here's Darwin's finches again. Um, they had, so there's probably a catastrophic event which wiped out all the birds. Uh, finches came from the mainland, found all these resources available. Um, but then diverged because there were all, all different types of re resources there, so the characters um, displaced among the species. And the result is you have lots of different species of finch, each with different little characters associated with the resource they um, specialize in. Okay, and I mentioned the Lake Victoria uh, cichlid fishes as well. Uh, this was another, very similar to the, the finches. Um, there's immense freshwater shallow lake and it has over 300, used to have over 300 species of cichlid fishes but because of overfishing and some introduced species a lot of those species are gone. The first um, fish occurred over 200,000 years ago um, and what, what happened is over time you had this rising and fall of the water level um, and that created different niches or different um, resources for the 
fish to specialize on, and it would separate them geographically for a time, um, and thus created uh, an array of, of species from this one species, and they all specialize on different uh, food types. So that some will filter feed the mud or their algae, all those different types. Okay, and what made them better than other fish that were already in the lake is they had a second pair of functioning jaws. And so then those jaws were able to specialize on these different food types. So they could um, specialize to eat mud or filter mud or uh, scrape the algae off of rocks and those other things. Okay, another example, the New Zealand Alpine buttercups. We're also um, uh, because of rise, kind of like the rising and falling of the, the sea level in the Lake Victoria. Um, these buttercups speciated through the rise and fall of glaciers. So this happened with the warming and cooling of the earth. And so what would happen is you would have species along the bottom parts here, and they wouldn't grow where the glaciers were. But as the glaciers receded, it would expose these mountaintops, and then they would specialize to these different areas in the mountaintops and be isolated from each other. And then they would, the glaciers would come again, and they would all be pushed back down and compete there. And so through these many different cycles, he created all these different species that specialized in different habitats. Okay, so speciation, uh, there's two different theories. Gradualism is one where just species over time just very gradually separate. The other one is called punctuated equilib equilibrium, where you have long periods where you have pretty much the same number of species and then some sort of catastrophic events cause, or change of events, causes a radiation or lots of species to be formed. And in reality, um, speciation over time has occurred in both ways, depending on the events or the cycles that the Earth is going through. Okay, we're going to take a break. Okay, so now that we know what a species is, one of the things biologists like to do is compare different species and figure out which ones are the most related, and when they evolved, how long ago they evolved from each other. So that is done in a, in a process called systematics, or a division of science called systematics. Um, and we'll start with the basic structures or the basic characteristics that all living things have, which we've gone over. We went over this in chapter one, right? Everything's composed of cells, has a, uh, a metabolism, which utilizes energy or organic molecules, um, and it uses ATP for energy, and it uses DNA as the molecular code to pass on information from one generation to the next, okay? Um, the tree of life accounts for, or they're, they're, these living things or these living characteristics apply to everything, including bacteria, you know, whales, the largest living animals, and giant sequoia trees, the largest living things. All these things have the same basic characteristics. Um, but if you're going to group things into different groups, um, you're going to start with the shared derived characteristics. So what, would, what do you think the first thing scientists use to group organisms together? How would you group organisms together? 
What's that? Where they live? Okay. What about species that live in the same area? How would you group them together? What they look like. Yeah. And for a long time, that's all we had um, was what species look like. So they group them together, the ones that look similar. Okay. Um, but now we also have genetics. So we can not only take what they look like, but we can take apart their genetic code and compare those. But again, it's looking at the similarities between the two. So systematics um, also looks at fossils. So another way to compare living things is to look at you know, the fossils, the extinct things that they came from. And uh, systematicists will do look at fossils, they'll look at um, living things, and they will create evolutionary relationships among them. So systematics is the science of um, reconstructing and studying evolutionary relationships. Phy a phylogeny is, these are all phylogenies. Phylogeny is a hypothesis. It's um, saying, based on the knowledge that I have, this is how I'm going to group these organisms. So if you can see, all of these have the same organisms on them. Um, they are just grouped in different ways. So this is three different hypotheses for how primates, which include humans, are grouped together. And they are, you can find some similarities, but they're all slightly different. So Darwin envisioned when he um, came up with natural selection that everything descended from one common ancestor. Um, and he called, you know, from that, you had this branch of all, di all different types of species that are alive today. Um, and the process was called descent with modification or um, evolution by natural selection. Cladistics is the process of looking at characters or phenotypes and creating a clade. Um, you can use derived characteristics. Derived meaning it is uh, a similar characteristic which is inherited from the most recent common ancestor of an entire group. Uh, an ancestral characteristic is something that um, that arose prior to the common ancestor of the group. But in cladistics, really only shared derived characteristics are considered helpful or informative. So what is a derived character of mammals? <laughs> Something that only mammals have sets us apart. Live births? Um, yes, but there are actually other animals that do live birth. So. No. What? Mammals specifically. Mammary glands, yes. So only mammals produce milk. What else? So um, live birth would be ancestor. Yes, they do need oxygen, but so does everything else. So that would be an ancestral <laughs> characteristic. No, uh, the other animals can be omnivores too. Birds can be omnivores. Lots of things. So anyway, that, those are some good ones. But um, so if it is only common to that group you're talking to, then it's derived. If it is common to more than just that group, then it would be ancestral. Okay, so hair is another derived characteristic of mammals. Okay, so birds have feathers, reptiles have scales, only animals have hair or fur. Wait, I thought dolphins have hair. They are. They do have little hairs. Um, lungs, though, is not exclusive to mammals, so it would be an ancestral trait. 
So the shared derived feature of hair suggests that all mammal species shared a common ancestor that evolved hair. And it evolved more recently than the ancestor that unites us with amphibians, reptiles, and birds. Okay, so if you were going to do a cladistic analysis, uh, what would you need? If we were going to set up, if you wanted to look at der derived and ancestral traits to classify a certain group of organisms, what would you need to do that? Their bodies. Their bodies, yeah. Yeah, so you would have, you would have to have... <coughs> First, you'd have to identify the group you're looking at, okay, so whatever it may be. And then you would need some sort of characters to look at. You'd either need derived or derived and ancestral characters. Um, and then you would write down those characters and you would polarize them as, or mark them as ancestral or derived. So, for example, T or presence or absence of teeth would probably be an ancestral um, character for mammals because they aren't the only things with teeth. Um, and then a lot of times you have an out group for comparison that's used. So let's say you're looking at a bunch of mammals and you want to classify them and you use a salamander as an out group. Okay? Um, and any characters that are similar to the salamander are going to be ancestral. So, for example, lungs. Salamanders have lungs. All your mammals have lungs. So that would be an ancestral characteristic. Okay. Uh, when the group under this study exhibits multiple character states, and one of those states is exhibited by the outgroup, this is what I just said, and that state is ancestral to the other, and the other ones are derived. And it's more reliable if the character state is exhibited by several different outgroups. So if you have one outgroup, that'd be good. But if you had like multiple ones, then it would confirm again that your ancestral derived traits. So the presence of teeth in mammals and reptiles is ancestral. But the absence of teeth in birds and turtles, so birds don't have teeth on their beaks. That is a derived characteristic. So it doesn't necessarily have to be something, a, a character trait that you have. It can be a character trait that you don't have. All right, so we're going to do a quick little one. I wrote a few things up here. Oh, sorry. Let's see. I'm going to write this bigger. So I'll write this down, and, and I'm going to write a bunch of traits over here. And I want you to group these animals based on these traits. You may need to help with some of these, but okay. Here's your traits. Here's your animals. Okay, the first thing you want to do is 
match some of these traits. Okay, so uh, large canines. Uh, your canines are these teeth. What groups of animals have really large can canines? Dogs. Dogs. What's that? Chimps. Yeah, I do, but... Well, ours are actually just normal. Um, so carnivores, things that eat meat. So your cat and your dog are going to have large canines. They kind of do, but ignore that. <laughs> Ever-growing incisors. So what are your incisors? Your front teeth. So what animals have ever-growing incisors? Rats. Yeah, rodents. That's why they're always gnawing on stuff. Okay, opposable thumbs. What groups? Humans. Humans. Anything else? Chimps. Chimps. All right, what has wings? Bats. Bats. And what has no hind limbs? Well, what lays eggs? Blackness. All right. So if you were going to group, so just do a small grouping, how would you group some of these? Well, you probably put the cat and the dog together, right? They're going to fight, but you're going to do it anyway. Okay, and what trait is going to unite them? A large incisor. So you would put this little mark here. That would be your trait, large incisor. Okay. Who, who, what else would you group together? Human and a chimp. Okay. Human and a chimp. What would be their trait? Opposable thumbs. What's that? I think you meant large canines. For Jim and Jim? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah. Hey, anything else you would group together? What's that? No. So, what about this one, the platypus? He lays eggs, all right? Do any of the other ones lay eggs? No? So what would you say about this trait? Not derived, ancestral. So you would put the platypus all by himself. And then everything else would kind of go off of there. Yeah, it is. Uh, so what would be original would be, so this guy lays eggs. So the original one would be live birth. So all of these guys have live birth. These guys lay eggs by themselves. Okay, and then we don't really have any other way to group the other ones. So we would just put them in there with their derived characters somehow. Whale. Bat. What else do we have? Rat. But 
if you wanted to, you could find characters and ways to group them. So, for example, whales have big brains, and so do chimps and humans. So you could put big brains here. And now this would be a derived character for this group. This isn't a very good one because we can't figure out what these are because we don't have enough characters. But in reality, you would have lots of characters and you would group these together according to their similarities. And this is, again, this isn't necessarily how it is. This is just our hypothesis based on the characters we looked at. So how could you form a stronger hypothesis or a stronger phylogeny? Kind of, let's say we're just using the same number of animals. What's that? Yeah, using more characteristics. The more characteristics you use, the more you know well defined you can give your groups. Okay, so what we just did is we made a clade based on shared uh, derived traits um, and those are called synapomorphies. A derived character that is shared by a whole group is a synapomorphy. So hair um, or some of the other ones, mammary glands, those are synapomorphies of mammals. And then the uh, ancestral states are called plesiomorphies. And sim plesiomorphies are shared ancestral traits. So that would be lungs. Lungs would be a plesiomorphy. A homoplasy is a shared character state that has not been inherited from a common ancestor and is also called a convergent uh, convergent evolved trait. So, for example, live birth, you mentioned that, that actually is a good indicator of mammals, but like sharks also have live birth. But it's not because we're related, it's actually because it evolved separately. So that would be a convergent trait or a homoplasy. So, you can actually group, if you have lots of traits, you can actually group them in lots of different ways and just start putting different traits that make them unique. But what's going to make the best clade, or the best cladogram or phylogeny, is going to be the one that has uh, the most parsimony, or that, that is the simplest. So here we have two clades looking at different, um, sorry, looking at different relationships between different animals or the same animals. One of them uh, uses three traits and then one of them uh, uses one, two, three, four, five traits. Okay, so the one that is most parsimony, parsimonious is the one that uses the fewer amount of traits. So this is, this is a good test question. I'll have two clades here and say which one shows the most parsimony. 
and you would point to the one that has the fewest number of traits. It was able to group them only using four traits. Well, this one had to use more traits. And this, this one is more correct because salamanders and frogs are more related than uh, you know, frogs and gorillas. Because they use uh, tail loss and groups frogs in with all these other things that don't have tails. Whereas this one used um, tail loss twice and, and called it a, a homoplasy. Anyway, look for the one that has the least number of traits, and that's the one that's most parsimonious. Uh, systematics is increasingly using uh, DNA sequences to look at relationships. And basically, those differences in base pairs, so you can see these are similar, but there are some that are different. Those differences would be, then, our traits, okay? even though they're just uh, base pairs. Um, each base pair is basically another trait. So if you wanted to look at, you know, make a better tree or make more definition, using genetics is a good way to go because it has lots of traits. And just like before, they usually use an outgroup some species that is not related to the other ones. And any sequences that are similar to the outgroup would be ancestral. And sequences that are not similar would be derived. All right, so classification is how we group organisms. And uh, there are different groups when we do this. A monophyletic group is a most recent common ancestor, and it's all of its descendants. So this is a monophyletic group, this purple outline here, because we have all of these ancestors and all of its common, uh, sorry, all of these descendants and all of its ancestors together. Okay, this is another thing that will be on the, on the exam. A paraphyletic group includes all the ancestors, but not all the descendants. So, this is an example of a paraphyletic group. So we have all the ancestors, okay, goes back to A, but it, A also has these descendants. So it's not monophyletic, it's paraphyletic. And then polyphyletic just grabs descendants that aren't related and puts them together. So here, we just have two descendants and we didn't include any of their ancestors. Okay. And so we have these taxonomic hierarchies, so mammals, birds, reptiles, um, and they're based on these shared traits, based on these common ancestors. Birds are an example of a paraphyletic group. As, uh, what, what did we learn from Archaeopteryx? What, is, what was Archaeopteryx? It was a dinosaur and a bird. Um, it was a, a transitional fossil that showed some bird traits and some dinosaur traits. So what, what evidence does Archaeopteryx point to about birds? They derive from dinosaurs. So what type of animals are dinosaurs? Reptiles, right? So then birds are reptiles, or should be included with the reptiles, but they're not, right? You think of reptile, you don't think of bird, right? 
but they descended from reptiles. So um, it's a paraphyletic group because you have these birds here, these groups, but you don't include turtles and snakes and all these other reptiles. Okay, and that's what this shows as well. Um, so a monophyletic group um, are called ar archosaurs. So this would include dinosaurs and birds and all other, uh, well, not all other reptiles. Okay, but when we say dinosaurs, we don't usually include birds. So that would be a paraphyletic group. And then a polyphyletic group would be flying flying vertebrates, which would be bats and birds, which aren't really related at all. It ignores all the other mammals and reptiles in between them. So if I put one of these on the test, I'll ask you which of these three it is, paraphyletic, monophyletic, or polyphyletic, and you need to be able to recognize them. I'll keep them really simple. I think there's an example on the practice exam, too. All right, so now we're going to switch a little bit. We're going to talk about a different species concept. We already talked about biological species concept as um, species are defined by their reproductive isolation. Okay, we can also set define species by their shared derived characteristics. Um, and that would be the phylogenetic species concept. So looking at the phylogeny, looking at those similar characters, that's our phylogenetic species. This does some things that the biological species concept couldn't do. So it accounts for um, by a species that would interbreed but don't, you can look at their genetics and see how they're genetically different or their traits. Um, and also accounts for oops, those asexual species such as a lot of plants that don't reproduce sexually so that um, breeding concept doesn't apply to them. But you can look at their genetics and look at those traits and divide them into species that way. So phylogenetics is becoming a greater um, tool in biology and is used in almost all associations with uh, comparing species um, and finding out the relationship between them. Um, it looks at homologous structures, which are derived from the same ancestral source. Um, we talked about this last time when we, uh, when we talked about evolution. So the the bones in a bat's hand and the bones in a human hand are homologous structures, meaning they are the same bones, derived from the same source. And if it's a convergent evolution, it's a homoplastic structure, such as the words of being, uh, birds and bats and dragonflies. They all do the same thing functionally, but they're derived from different, different things. Okay, most um, complex characters aren't just evolved in one step, but through a series of, of, or through a series, you can find it in the fossil record through a series of, of fossils. So Archaeopteryx was the first um, fossil found, which was kind of a transitionary fossil between birds and, and dinosaurs. But now there's been lots, uh, or at least... A, more that show more bird-like structures and more dinosaur-like structures. Um, and so a more complete phylogeny can be uh, given that shows the evolution of birds. Um, and feathers uh, seems to have been evolved for, not for flight, but for uh, insulation. 
um, but then were later used to help birds uh, fly. Uh, phylogenetics also helps us uh, determine and uh, quantify species diversification. So, for example, in beetles, uh, especially beetles that eat wood, you can find that they evolved with the evolution of certain types of trees that they feed upon. Um, beetles with con that have evolved with conifers or cone-bearing plants, so like pine trees, you find that those go a lot further back because uh, conifers evolved before flowering plants, which are angiosperms. So beetles that evolved to eat flowering plants um, have shorter branches, meaning they evolved uh, more recently. Okay, uh, this is just a figure from the book showing the difference that uh, green would be the conifers and how it goes back further in evolutionary time. And the angiosperms are the purple, they'll go back as far how they evolve. And if you looked at a beetle um, evolutionary tree, it would be similar to the uh, to these trees. All right, so we're talking a little bit about disease evolution. This is where that uh, extra credit assignment comes in. We talk about AIDS. AIDS was first recognized in the 1980s um, as being caused by the human immunodeficiency virus. Currently, there are about 33 million people infected, and about 2 million people will die each year from this. Um, it seems to evolve from a similar, similar virus called the simian immunodeficiency virus found in 36 species of pri uh, primates. But they seem to be immune to it. They have it, but they don't, it doesn't really cause illness to them. Um, and it's been because they've had it for over a million years, so they've developed or evolved a immunity to it. Um, when you look at HIV and SIV, um, you can see, looking at the evolutionary tree, you can see that they are related. HIV is nested within groups of SIV. There have been a number of different strains of HIV that have, have arisen, um, and you can see that HIV is most closely related to SIVs that have been found in chimpanzees, which is where they think HIV originated from, from a chimpanzee. Okay. And a couple strains are more closely re related to these chimpanzee train, uh, strains than to each other indicating that it, it was transferred from a chimpanzee to a human in multiple different times. Um, there have been a number of different theories. Again, one of them is on the podcast um, that actually HIV came from two different viruses that came from two different monkeys that were transferred into a chimpanzee and then somehow from a chimpanzee into a human. Um, chimpanzees will eat other monkeys, so they think that's how the chimpanzee got it. And then sometimes people will eat chimpanzees. So that's how they think that people first got it, is by eating a chimpanzee or being exposed, exposed to the blood somehow. Um, and they've traced it back to Africa. They think it came somewhere in the... Democratic Republic of Congo. And then from there, uh, in the early 1900s, um, spread into m multiple areas around the world, um, but then exploded in the United States in you know, 1970s, 1980s. Um, but yeah, listen to that podcast. It's actually really interesting. 
because um, what they had to do was kind of, so they wanted to find the first patient, you know, they wanted to trace it back to somebody. Um, and they were able to, well, I'm not going to ruin it for you. You better listen to it. It's fun. Um, did anyone listen to it yet? Okay, HIV-2 is much less widespread, and it seems to be related to the West African monkeys. Um, but subtypes of HIV-2 also appear um, in several independent cross-species transmission to humans. So even though there is a theory for how one, uh, one form of HIV was transmitted, it probably arose uh, multiple different times. Okay, uh, and we can use these phylogenies to actually trace in uh, people that have HIV to figure out where they got it. Because HIV mutates so rapidly, you can take strains from different parts of the world and you can, um, just by looking at their genetics, you can, you can see where they got it, um, where someone, what part of the world someone contracted the, the HIV strain. Um, and you can even go so far as to find the genetics between two different people that were infected and, and trace the origin of HIV that way. All right, that's all. No, that was a long lecture. Thanks for hanging in there.